In, in the Bible to Proverbs 20, we're going to look at a verse that um, uh, has kind of been uh, rolling around that I've been meditating on. You know, leader, leadership is, is really what Jumpstart is all about, but there's so many misconceptions concerning leadership, even in the church. Leadership isn't a position. It's not power. Um, it's not control. Um, leadership is responsibility. And we all have responsibility, even if it's just for our own life. And it's to the degree that we are faithful in that, that we can continue to take our place in the body and in his plan. Um, but he doesn't promote on the basis of anything outside of faithfulness. You know, many of you have probably heard Pastor Dean talk about, um, and if not as adults, but um, young people heard him give his testimony several years ago in summer internship about a time when he he was a young boy and sensing a call into the ministry. Well, he had to do something about that. That wasn't going to be an automatic. That was going to require something of him. You know, I heard Brother Copeland say that recently, uh, very similarly, when he was a young teenager at youth camp. He sensed a call into the ministry, and he wasn't anywhere close to in a position to serve the Lord. And, and then even after that, had been running from that. When he and Gloria first met, he was a pilot. And one of the very first things that she said to him was, I'll never marry a preacher. I don't want to marry a preacher. You know what I mean? So he wasn't, even when they first met, in any sort of position to even lend itself to that either. I say all that to say that sometimes we put it all on God or some prophetic something that somebody has said over us that wasn't the Holy Ghost at all or just, you know, a, a, an, an honest and the sincere love and respect for somebody that we see in an office of leadership. You know, a lot of people pursue um, leadership for mammon. You know, they want to be at the top because of a perceived exchange financially, which that's mammon. That's not at all what we should be looking. But, but even from an early age, you know, sometimes children who aren't faithful, they're not proficient. They're encouraged to go to college. They're encouraged that if they don't do this, that they're not going to have this sort of financial security. It, these are the wrong conversations with a 15-year-old. Let's start with what's in your phone and, and what are your chores? What is your homework? You, you know, what is your attitude? What is your attitude? You know, I talk with so many adults who don't want to have anything to do with teenagers. And I try to tell them, <laughs> people don't like you. <laughs> and I love you. I, I feel born to love you. I feel called to love you. But I'm not going with you in every season of life. What's your attitude? We're, we're having the wrong conversations. Leadership is about responsibility. It's about taking responsibility for your life, not power not position, not a call. And so when we get together once a week and we, we jumpstart our week as it pertains to leadership, we're really taking a really hard look at faithfulness, how responsible we've been. We're really looking at, at those things that are kind of behind closed doors that will either make or break God's ability to continue to unlock and unfold one step at a time. And so Proverbs 20, well, hold your place in Proverbs 20. Let's go to Matthew 20 and just give a little bit of context because this was a very important conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have a red letter Bible, I encourage you to get one. That's an important pro part of your study and a, an important part of your process is to know what is in red to have it standing out for you as it relates to what did Jesus say. So in Matthew 20, 25, you know that the princes of Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them. 
but it shall not be so among you. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. So in, ev- in essence, Jesus is saying, if you look at the model of, of Pharaoh, for example, who enslaved um, the, the, the people of Israel and, and, and everything was about dominion and authority and control, less responsibility. I don't have to do anything. I'm gonna get people to do everything for me. Jesus is saying, that's not the model at all. Whoever um, would want to be great would be the servant, meaning more responsibility. The further you go in leadership, you become more responsible, not less responsible. Whoever will be the chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to be a minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, Pastor Faith was talking with some interns this week, you know, because in this season of life, you're, you're facing some big, big decisions in obedience to the plan of God, the purpose of God, whether in the marketplace or in the ministry, those are your only two options. But in either place, you are to build a certain way, which we'll look at in a second. But it's like, you know, uh, that decision and of course who you're gonna marry in this, in this young, but, but the reality is you're not stewarding all the single people verses. You're not stewarding the single people verses. There's more married people verses. There's more responsibility once you enter into that covenant, not less responsibility. Right? And so we, we have to recognize that in every relationship, I have to be positioned and that looks a certain way. So Proverbs 20, 28 says good leadership. Everyone say good leadership. leadership. It's built on love and truth. Good leadership is built on love and truth. Now we're going to break that down to just the, the, the component of leading yourself first and foremost. You know, for every believer, we should build a certain way. It's the same for all of us. Again, whether we're called to the marketplace or we're called to the ministry. And so when we look at these foundations that we see in the word of God, and we've talked about this before, but but now to have it here, it almost looks like a tiered wedding cake. That's what it made me think of. And we are gonna have a wonderful marriage supper of the lamb. Okay, so here's the foundation, is the words of Jesus. Good leadership is built on love and truth. John 14, six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We said it last week, Jesus, if he's the way, the truth, and the life, then Jesus is source, which means his words are source. So that's the foundation. What did Jesus say? When you advance from there, because revelation is progressive, when Jesus was on the earth, the church hadn't been birthed yet. We are not Jewish people. We were Gentile. But now coming into the faith by accepting Jesus as the Lord of our life, now we're in the church. So we build on the words of Jesus into the letters, or as many people have called it, the Pauline revelations, which gives us position. You can't take your position until you first established his words as the source of your life. So like in in your own personal life on a regular basis, like Pastor Kathy says, your go-to is what does the word say? What does the word say about what I feel right now? What does the word say about what I think? What does the word say? There's a lot going on right here with the mic and the hair. Okay, Jesus name. What, every time I move, it gets all. What does the word say about this, uh, this relationship? What does the word say? And not a version of the word not a traditional what someone else's interpretation is, which is why you have to surrender to the person of the Holy Spirit and you have to make yourself accountable. You can only hear the shepherd, really his, his setup was through an under shepherd. It's through your pastor that you should be introduced to the great shepherd and, and, and allow these truths to be rightly divided. Now you may say, well, everybody doesn't have that. And that's true. And Paul did say, you don't need teachers 
because you had the Holy Ghost, but he didn't mean that those offices were obsolete or that would have thrown out Ephesians chapter four when he gave us context for all those. What it means is they should bear witness, they should cooperate. That without that person in your face, you hear their voice, you have a foundation of their training and cooperating and building upon that and the relationship that you have personally with the Holy Spirit, you should be sound. You should be making sound choices. And if you don't have a, an under shepherd that shows you the shepherd, that should be a problem. That should be a problem. That should be uh, 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 something that you take a hard and fast look at as a family. You know, if you live in a community and you don't have that, you don't have that fellowship, you don't, you don't, you're not able to assemble together, th that's a problem. Yeah. No matter how much money you're making or, you know, you know the, the landscape of the, you know, I, I'm working with a young, a young person right now who, who is answering the call of God to move here, you know, to be a part of this church and what God is doing here. That's not something she wants to do in the sense that there's beautiful trees and there's beautiful parks, and there's cute little coffee shops. There's not. And that's not to take anything away from the ones that exist, but you know what I mean? But at some point you have to, and, and we'll look at this, you have to look at your values. And so then from here, you build, because without that, your, your top layer's gone, because this is the vision of your local church. This is, this is how we operate as believers. So many people have their, their head cut off, so to speak, because they don't, they don't, they don't in, invoke this, this last thing. You know, I think about, and I know a lot of people, um, obviously from the outside when they come in and celebrate what God's, able, God's been able to do through this building, but there's so much more. But it takes each and every one of us accepting this vision as our personal vision. And that, that is what we're, we're, we're not responsible for what's happening in Washington. We're not responsible for what's happening in Santa Fe. We're not responsible for what's happening anywhere outside of where we live. That's where we have dominion. That's where we have dominion and authority in prayer, right? Now, as American citizens, we have some jurisdiction, but ultimately we should be taking authority and dominion right here. So what has God called us to do right here? We have to accept the voice of God through our pastor, you know, again, thinking about what we've done, but I was thinking about another church that I, that I love and respect. And, and for years and years, the, the people respond to this pastor's leadership. And most recently they've done incredible things for people all over the world, not just in their local community. Why? Because they receive the word of the Lord from their pastor. They recognize truth for my life looks like this. Do you notice no, there's nothing in here about what you want. Yes, right. There's nothing in here about your dreams. There's nothing in here about your dreams. Remember what Pastor Dean said years, uh, it's been about a year ago now, but we've used it in Jumpstart so much. I refuse to take a gospel and the, this gospel and turn it into what's in it for me instead of what I can do for him. That's why the foundation has to be the words of Jesus. So when we're looking at truth, we're looking at our value system because in a misappropriation of value, you will be in a lie. In a misappropriation of value, you will be in a lie. So go to Mark chapter 10, and we've used these verses quite a bit. This is the story of the rich young ruler. In a misappropriation of value, you will be in a lie. So we have to determine for ourselves as individuals, before we even enter into a marriage covenant, before we, we take on God's plan for our life in ministry or in business, we have, to, we have to determine our own value system in line with truth. Because it's only to the degree that we build on truth that we will be sound. In Mark 10, 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man came running up to him. Kneeling down in front of him, he cried, good teacher, what one thing am I required to do to gain eternal life? Jesus responded, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. 
You already know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not cheat, honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, teacher, I have carefully obeyed these laws since my youth. Jesus fixed his gaze upon the man with tender love. You know, one of my favorite things about leadership, and we were talking about this with the interns this morning, you know, the, the, the opposite of, um, of, of leadership in the, in the Bible um, economy, so to speak, biblical is, is this power trip, control, power, all these things. That's not how it is in the body of Christ. You know, I told the interns, there's some of you that I would love to, to you know, have some conver- conversations, but you don't want it. You don't want it. Love doesn't force itself. Gosh, if I had, if I just had 50 cents for every time I thought in love to go out of my way to tell somebody the truth about a situation and they didn't have the, they didn't have the humility to receive it. And I became their problem. And then by default, that truth became their problem because they, did, they, they didn't have the stomach for it. And you have to ask yourself, do I have the stomach for correction? Do I wanna be corrected? And if I don't wanna be corrected, and am, I, am I content to look at my life and say, this is all that there will ever be? No matter how old you are. If that's all, if you're not growing, you're dying. And growth comes with correction. Yes, you're doing your very best until you know to do better. And then you should desire to do better. But love doesn't force itself, meaning it's pointless. It's pointless. I can't tell you how many times my family, Greg, Charity, waste of time, waste of time, waste, wasted time. You wasted time. You wasted time. You wasted energy. You wasted conversations. It's not love. Love doesn't force itself on other people. You have to be conditioned. You have to say, you know what? I'm the kind of person that I want you to protect my blind side. I want you to see things in me that I don't see. I want you to tell me what can be better. But because love is under no obligation and you'll see this in what Jesus did. He looked at him and he loved him. And he said, there's one thing still in you lacking Go and sell all that you have and give the money to the poor. Then all of your treasure will be in heaven. After you've done this, come back and walk with me. Completely shocked by Jesus's answer, he turned and walked away very sad. You just ask Jesus himself for an answer. He gave you an answer and you walked away sad. What is that? You valued what you had over truth. He valued what he had over the truth. Jesus told him the truth, but in a misappropriation of value, he walked away to live a lie because he valued what he had more than truth. None of us are above that. A misappropriation of true value. What do you value? Because you will reproduce who you are in the lives of those that are hungry. Now, don't take that on, just like Brother Hagen said, you don't judge me by the students that come through my Bible school, and I won't judge you by the people in your congregations. Don't judge my leadership by people who have been through the youth ministry. I have them for a couple hours a week. Don't judge me by people who have been through the internship. I, again, have them a couple hours a week, and they have a free will, just like you do just like you do. Would you want your pastor to be judged by the fruit that you're bearing behind closed doors? Would you want your pastor to be judged by the thoughts in your head? Don't do that to anybody else, right? So he walked away because he valued what he had more than the truth. He was extremely rich. Jesus looked at the faces of his disciples and he said, how hard is it for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom realm? Now turn your Bibles over to John chapter 12, because we're looking at how truth must be based in or progressively built upon the right value system. There's things that try to, try to hinder that. In John chapter 12, 
Verse one, six days before the Passover began, Jesus went back to Bethany, the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. They had prepared a supper for Jesus and Martha served and Lazarus and Mary were among those at the table. Mary picked up an alabaster jar filled with nearly a liter of extremely rare and costly perfume, the pur purest extract of nard, and she anointed Jesus's feet. Then she wiped them dry with her long hair and the fragrance of the costly oil filled the house. But Judas, the locksmith, Simon's son, the betrayer spoke up and said, what a waste. We could have sold this perfume for a fortune and given the money to the poor. Verse six, in fact, Judas had no heart for the poor. He only said that because he was a thief and in charge of the money case. He would steal money wherever he wanted from the funds given to support Jesus's ministry. So what's the misappropriation of value? Works over Jesus. Yeah. Works over Jesus. Now, obviously the thread of that religious spirit and those works bled into carnality because Judas was a thief, but some people would rather work for God than surrender to God. They would rather have a form of godliness. They, it's like they make a deal. We're not gonna tithe, but we serve. That's not biblical. You don't get to serve at the expense of your tithe. You're called to do both. You don't make a deal with God. Religion makes a deal with God. Ultimately, that's what Judas did. He made a deal for 30 pieces of silver. He sold him over. So if you value works over relationship with Jesus, that's gonna be evident in your life. Look at Psalms 127, um, and I'm reading from the Passion Bible, verses one and two. If God's grace doesn't help the builders, they will labor in vain to build a house. It goes back to that that we've always said, if it's not from him, it can't be for him. If God's mercy doesn't protect the city, all the centuries will circle it in vain. It's really senseless to work so hard from early morning till late at night. Now, some of you say amen and you shouldn't say amen because you're lazy. That's not, this isn't talking about you. You should get up and work. This is not about using all of your energies because that contradicts Mark 12, 30. Yeah. Mark 12, 30 says to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, all your intelligence. So I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about sitting back because stewards are out hustling, yeah. but there's a grace about it. There's an anointing about it. There's a rhythm and a flow about it. It's really senseless to work so hard from early in the morning till late at night, toiling. Toiling involves fear. It involves worry. When you're working from a place of relationship with Jesus and he's directing you, there's a flow. There's a flow about that, that even whenever you've expended all the energy that you feel as though you have, he supplements that and there's a supernatural supply to keep continuing to bear much fruit. Because that's what Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will you'll bear much fruit in John 15. So if you're gonna bear much fruit, then you're gonna be more productive than though as the body of Christ, we should be. We should be the most productive. Our businesses should be the most productive. Our homes should be the most orderly. Our, our lives, our churches, there should be fruit. Listen, that's not like just tangible. That's just like, I, I just have the peace. Okay, well use some of that peace to get your children to have peace. Do you know what I mean? Cause some people are just so blissfully like full of something but there's no signs following that. Do you know what I mean? Like all their ducks aren't in a row behind them. They're all over the place, but they're like, you know, everything's great. Just me and Jesus. No, it's not. That's you and somebody, but that ain't him. That ain't him. Cause everybody in children's church is pulling their hair out. You know what I mean? So this is stewardship. Okay. So we're, we're valuing the right thing, but we're not allowing it like meaning what I'm doing for God, right? I'm doing with God and in him because he's called me to do this. And we're, Jesus worked. 
okay? For three and a half years, he was not like laying back. He was catching a nap when he had a chance, okay? He was putting in work. If you're gonna bear fruit, you have to work. I think that's one of the greatest misconceptions about fruitfulness in the kingdom. Faith without works is dead. One of my favorite things that Pastor Hagen, the only other pastor I've ever had besides Pastor Dean, said ministry is spelled W-O-R-K. Said from a true minister's kid. This is what it really is at the end of the day. But there's a difference in actually working with him and toiling and laboring and worrying and fear. In Luke chapter nine, verse 57, and we'll finish up here. On their way, someone came up to Jesus and said, I wanna follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, yes, but remember this, even animals in the field have holes in the ground to sleep in and birds have their nests, but the son of man has no place to lay down his head. So a mis appropriation of value is when people will choose natural security over following Jesus. Natural security over following Jesus. We want all of the reward without taking an initial step of faith that will stretch us. If Pastor Zine and Kathy had never stepped out until there was gonna be adequate financing to match what they were presently making, none of us would be here. None of us would be here. And we think, oh, well, that's for the pastors. No, that's for you. That's for you to look at your life. And instead of having this attitude that church is the problem, you know, people who think that they're gonna burn out here, you're not even lit. And I don't mean lit in a wrong way. I mean like, I mean like you're not even on fire. You have no concern. Anybody that thinks like that, don't even worry about it. It's not gonna touch you. You don't even get it. You don't even get it. So, so natural security, you're looking at your week and you're saying, what is gonna, you know, listen, men will be lovers of pleasures in this day and time, more than lovers of God. Pleasures doesn't have to be, have to mean on holiday or at the lake every weekend. It can just mean as a weekly routine, I want this cushion of my own time. I want this cushion of what you call family time, which is really your kids doing whatever they want while you and your husband get to do whatever they want or whatever. Do you know what I mean? You you have to have the, you have all these rules. You have all these rules. I can't serve here, I can't do this. You know, this is my date night, this is my, you have all these rules. Natural security, the the son of God himself is calling you to a place of service that never gets old to me, that he would actually pick me and allow me to do anything for him. And I've got these other things. We, uh, the kids have to be in bed at this time and all that's all, that's the same thing as this. That's the same thing as this. This doesn't make your life worse. This makes your life better. But people value having all their little ducks in a row the way that they like at the expense of his call and his plan. You know, we go to a conference um, every year and the, the, parent, the parents bring their kids in their jammies. They know they're gonna be there forever. You know what I mean? Well, my kids, is, you know, they just need more structure. You're right, they do. They probably should be in a school system learning how to play with themselves. You're right. You're right. Stick with that. Stick with that. It's a good plan. Good plan for the church. Because I don't care what they do. But we're the people of God. Amen. We're the people of God. And they have a very potent agenda for your family. They have a very potent agenda for your future. No matter how old you are. So if you don't really come to value this agenda, you're going to be gobbled up. And not just with the dumb butt. They'll take you out. That's their ultimate agenda. Jesus turned to another and said, come be my my disciple. He replied, someday I will, Lord, but allow me first to fulfill my duty as a good son and wait until my father passes away. Soul ties over Jesus. You know, when the kids are older and that that day never comes, soul ties over Jesus. The son of God is staring you in the face every time the truth comes into your life. 
every time you hear it. Jesus told him, don't wait for your father's burial. Let those who are already dead wait for death. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere that God's kingdom has arrived. Still another said to the Lord, I wanna follow you too, but first let me go home and say goodbye to my entire family, past over Jesus. I gotta get these things worked out in my past. I've gotta get to a different level of financial security and stability, and those days never come. He said, why do you keep looking back to your past and having second thoughts about following me? If you turn your back, you're not fit for God's kingdom. Last statement, discipline provides a foundation for direction. We discipline our value system. We command its surrender to the word of God, which is truth.